Good evening. This is, uh, this is my first time as a part of the McClure Lectures, and it's uh, moving uh, to hear of the history, the tradition behind this, and I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Part of the siren uh, song of Pittsburgh doesn't have as much to do with uh, the dropping of verbs in the middle of sentences and the confusing streets. Um, it has more to do with the fact that God is up to something in this place and in this community, and I'm thrilled to be a part of, of that. Now, I had nothing to do with the invitation of Bishop uh, Graham Clay to, uh, Cray to, this, um, to this lecture series, so I can say uh, that having him here this week really is, uh, really is timely for us as a community in a whole variety of ways. Um, for one, uh, here in North America, and in particular the United States, we're just really now starting to wake up to the fact that uh, our, our identity as the church and the society has shifted and that we are no longer at the center of power and control. Um, and that North America, and America in particular, has become a kind of mission field. Um, a, a place where to go outside of the walls of the church is to build a, a bicultural bridge community with others that might think or act uh, or believe very differently uh, than we do. Now, the, the church uh, in England has been ahead of the curve on this. Um, and so uh, Bishop Cray was a part of the fresh, led the Fresh Expressions movement uh, for many years uh, in the UK. And what the Fresh Expressions movement has done is they've essentially um, responded to uh, this, this identity change um, without resorting to uh, pragmatic or technical solutions, but rather through careful practices of careful attention to society, to the church, um, and to their neighbors and to their, to their neighborhood, along with very intentional theological reflection. They've pioneered in practices of discernment to begin understanding what does the Church of Jesus Christ look like uh, in this setting. Now, I've had the benefit of spending a day and a half uh, already with uh, Bishop Cray, and, and I can say that again and again, he tells stories about being surprised by the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and in this surprise, recognizing that, that uh, God is up to something, uh, even when we aren't always aware of it. And part of our task is to discern to pay attention and then to respond appropriately. Um, so let's welcome uh, Bishop Cray and uh, with, with a round of applause. And uh, again, it's just an honor to have him here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It is also my privilege to be allowed to give this year's McClure Lectures. My, my wife and I uh, spent three weeks in South Sudan earlier this year in Ye and in Kwajok, and in, the, in Kwajok we did stay in one of those huts, so uh, I, I'm so pleased I can make that connection. Uh, in the first lecture I tried to tell and reflect on really the story of what we call the Fresh Expressions Movement in, in, in the UK. Uh, the journey we've been on for 10 years has led us to begin to think again and to think differently about the church. And it's really that that I want to focus on now. And I'm going to begin with a quotation from our report, Mission Shaped Church, without really commenting, but we'll get to it, to it later. We wrote, enculturation is essentially a community process from below. Its purpose is to allow the gospel to transform a culture from within. No serious attempt at enculturation can begin with a fixed view of the outward form of the local church, to which I would add before the process of discernment has taken place. So, theological resources and, uh, and reflection. The Fresh Expressions Movement has been theologically informed and its praxis has led to further theological inquiry. The urgency of developing new practice in a changed context has led to further theological reflection on the nature of the church. Uh, 
Nicholas Healy wrote, contextual ecclesial praxis, which is what I've been talking about in the first lecture, informs ecclesiology, and ecclesiology informs contextual ecclesial practice. In a practical hermeneutical circle, there is an, an interchange between the experience of pioneer mission and reflection on the nature of the church. And a movement catalyzed through the Church of, a church of England report quickly became ecumenical as most of the major churches in the UK faced the same missional challenge. So it's appropriate that the theological sources drawn on in Mission Shaped Church and by its heirs are also ecumenical. So from systematic theology and contemporary missiology, we drew the emphasis on Missio Dei, a Trinitarian understanding. Mission is God's mission. The church is both the fruit of that mission and a primary agent of it. Both the triune God and the church are missional by their very nature. Mission is a first step for God, not an afterthought or a corrective. And likewise, mission is at the heart of the church's identity, not merely one of its activities. A church which is not missional in its practice suffers from amnesia. It has forgotten both who and whose it is. And this has been an essential corrective for, in my context, a Christendom church which has a set view of its proper cultural form and had often reduced outreach to an optional activity. It's also placed mission into the context of spirituality. Mission is a divine activity in which we participate, not a human effort which we entreat God to bless. If God is living and active, then church planting should attend to deserving God's initiative in their lives and context. It requires that we engage the living trinity now on the ground in the mission that is around us and ahead of us. But, and I'm off script already, the danger of Missio Dei is, is, is that you can call everything Missio Dei. And, but the definitive form of Missio Dei was the incarnation of the Son of God. Missio Dei is Christocentric. Hence, another primary source was the Roman Catholic teaching on enculturation that had developed since Vatican II. Uh, Bishop Montefiore's application of this to mission at home, which I mentioned in the previous lecture, was taken up in Mission, mission Shaped Church, in which we wrote this. One of the central features of this report is the recognition that the changing nature of our missionary context requires a new enculturation of the gospel within our society. The theology and practice of enculturation or contextualization is well established in the world church and world mission, but has received little attention for mission in the West. We have drawn on this tradition as a major source for the Church of England. Enculturation is central to this report because it provides a principal, principled basis for the costly crossing of cultural barriers and the planting of the church into a changed social context. Now, the historic incarnation is a once-for-all unique act on which our salvation depends. But from the New Testament on, it's been understood as the model for discipleship and cross-cultural mission. Gouda writes, when we expound both the what and how of mission incarnationally, we need to be careful always to emphasize that the incarnation is the unique event that founds and forms the church's witness. The event defines how it is to be embodied and thus communicated. That's so important, I'll repeat it. The event, the event defines how it is to be embodied and thus communicated. Inculturation is an imitation of Christ in his mission. I preached on that in chapel this morning. Christology shapes missiology, which shapes ecclesiology. The third theological source comes from pneumatology, the doctrine of the Spirit, and eschatology. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the church is to be as much a foretaste of the future as a steward of the inheritance of the past. To quote Newbigin, the church lives in the midst of history as a sign, instrument, and foretaste of the reign of God. 
And the Church of England has embraced this vocabulary in many of its documents. I quote, The Church does more than merely point to a reality beyond itself. By virtue of its participation in the life of God, it is not only a sign and instrument, but also a genuine foretaste of God's kingdom called to show forth visibly in the midst of history God's final purpose for humankind. Or a bit more pithily from Maltman, the gospel is not a statement about some remote future. It is the dawn of that future in the world. And this is vital for any church finding itself trapped in the forms and strategies that were designed for an era of culture which has passed away or which has become marginal. And the emphasis on mission as God's mission has led to further focus on the work of the Holy Spirit as the active front line leader of the church's mission. Discernment, seeing what God is doing and joining in, becomes the key to both planting and maintaining fresh expressions of church. And from the church planting movement comes the insight that the church is designed to reproduce. Growth is a mark of health in many, but clearly not all, contexts. This is an essential dimension of any missionary ecclesiology. Churches are created by God to grow. And this acts as a corrective to Christendom churches, which now tend to view decline fatalistically as an inevitability in their context. And finally, Archbishop Williams introduced a more dynamic ecclesiology. Church is a verb before it is a noun. It is an activity before it is an institution. In his forward to mission-shaped church, he wrote, If church is what happens when people encounter the risen Jesus and commit themselves to sustaining and deepening that encounter in their encounter with each other, there's plenty of theological room for diversity of rhythm and style. Or again, at one of our national conferences, because ecclesia is a Greek word that simply means a calling together, who calls? Jesus. When he calls, this is what happens. And if we have to stick a label on it, we call it church. Church is what emerges under the, present, under the pressure of Jesus' presence. I love that. Church is what emerges under the pressure of Jesus' presence. The community that is drawn together, called, summoned into being by the pressure of Christ's presence, is then the community that takes the responsibility for living out that presence and that pressure so that others are called. Another way of saying the church is essentially missional. And the idea of church as an event around Jesus fits well with an understanding found in another of our partners, the Church of Scotland's Church Without Walls report. Church is, that report says, people on the move with Jesus, going wherever Jesus leads them. I'm coming to the conclusion that it may be that the most significant New Testament model for ecclesiology at this time in the West is Jesus on mission with his disciples. Itineracy, as seen in both the four Gospels and Acts, is a core value to be embraced by an overstatic institutional church. And Luke T. Johnson makes the point that the corollary of itinerary is responsiveness to the movement of the Holy Spirit once a church is geographically settled. Contextual church planting, then, is a form of principled improvisation. This makes discernment the primary capacity required for planting new congregations. Fresh expressions are contextual. They're birthed through a process of enculturation. The Church of England, recognizing the cultural distance existing between its historic approach to church and a significant proportion of the population, set itself a new task. And again, I quote from our report, to become church for them, among them, and with them, and under the Spirit of God to lead them to become church in their own culture. And as the quote from Mission Shaped Church at the start of this lecture says, I come to it at last, <clears throat> the process cannot begin, quotes, with a fixed form of the outward view of the, lo of the local church. 
Rather, the location, character, style, and missional focus of a fresh expression emerge and are then directed through a process of discernment, through a focused and deliberate attentiveness to the Holy Spirit in the context. And this is one of the many reasons for which the Spirit is given. Thomas Smale. It is helpful to think of the Spirit as an artist whose one subject is the sun and who is concerned to paint countless portraits of, of that subject on countless human canvases using the paints and brushes provided by countless human cultures and historical situations. This does not mean a complete disregard of scripture or of the history and tradition of the church or that of a particular tradition or denomination. Guided by the scriptures, pioneer leaders know that there are core characteristics of any church, worship, community, prayer, scripture, baptism, holy communion, mission, and so on. But they're asking what form these should take in the context to which God has called them. How should the body of Christ take visible form here? One practitioner wrote, the church itself must continually undergo the process of discerning the spirits and of discerning what is essential and what is peripheral to Christian belief and practice as the early church did. They must continually discern how the universal promise in Jesus might best be enacted in each particular context. Pioneer planters will bring the knowledge of the traditions and values of their particular denomination, combined with an awareness of their denomination's weaknesses. Hopefully, they'll be aware of the values which underline these particular practices. And discernment may well involve identifying ways in which these values can take appropriate, perhaps different form in their context. And they will need to be equally aware of their own impatience with their traditions practices, often the characteristic of a pioneer, so that their discernment, so-called, is not simply a reaction against what was known previously. The process of discernment will normally be corporate. Most fresh expressions of church in the UK are planted by a team of between three and 12. And however much creative individuals or leaders may be involved, the team as a whole has to own the process of discernment. Ownership normally comes through participation. And there are no shortcuts in the discernment process. Blueprint models of the church tend to be generalized and applied like a franchise irrespective of context. Fresh Expressions practitioners face the temptation of cloning previous experience rather than doing the patient work of listening to the Holy Spirit in the context. I'll go off script again. As a working bishop in Kent, the, one of the things that made me shudder was to hear a new priest arriving in a parish and say, well, in my previous parish, cloning happens when practitioners try and reproduce something that's proved effective in one place without paying proper attention to the new context and the active of the, action of the Holy Spirit in it. Our novices to this approach are impressed by one of the stories on the Fresh Expressions website, Let's Do Tube Station, and set out to reproduce it, again without attention to context. The purpose of the stories is to enlarge people's imagination about the wide range of possibilities and the endless creativity of the Holy Spirit, not to provide a model to clone. Cloned Fresh Expressions, I'm going to mix my metaphor, rarely take root. The name Fresh Expressions of Church comes from the Church of England's Declaration of Assent, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, through which each ordained minister acknowledged that the gospel is to be proclaimed afresh in each generation. Missional leaders are to discern how the universal gospel of Christ, which is good news for every culture and era, is to be proclaimed and embodied in their context. This is how local churches become or remain true to their missional vocation. Uh, Bevans and Schroeder, the church is missionary by its very nature, but it becomes missionary by attending to each and every context in which it finds itself. Both faithfulness to the historic gospel 
and appropriate contextual engagement are dimensions of the church's apostolicity, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Maltman has written, where the retrospective bond with the apostles is concerned, the historical church will ask about continuity and strive for continuity. But where the future its apostolate serves is concerned, it will be open to leap forward to what is new and surprising. Both and, not either or. Discernment involves a faithful stewardship of the gospel we have received, combined with attentiveness to its engagement with its current context. And this may result in discoveries of facets of a great tradition that had not previously been grasped or understood that way, as we see it engage and transform settings with which we were not previously familiar. In the second century, the church father Irenaeus called the Son and the Spirit the two hands of God. Church planting, which is both anchored in the Christian tradition and contextual, needs to be a two-handed process. Both Christology, the doctrine of Christ, and pneumatology, the doctrine of the Spirit, need to be brought to bear. The Orthodox theologian Metropolitan John Zizoulos wrote that Christ institutes the church and the Spirit constitutes. The institution, he said, is something presented to us, more or less a fait accompli. The constitution, because con means with, is something that involves us in its very being, something that we freely accept because we take part in its very emergence. In other words, the personal work of Christ is the given of the gospel. Any attempt at translation or embodiment of the gospel has to be faithful to that which is given. The church is only the body of Christ as in 1 Corinthians 12, it is if it is the Christ of the scriptures and one, as in 1 Corinthians 15, who is being embodied. The body of Christ is called to bear the image of the biblical Christ. But translatability is also the essence of the gospel. Christianity is culturally infinitely translatable. The early church quickly dispensed with the culture and language of its founder and opened up other languages and cultures uh, uh, for references to that Lamin Sani and Andrew Walls. Our gospels are missionary documents in which the original words of Jesus have been translated into Greek, the primary first century language for mission. The translation is not of words alone, but from one culture to another. The Holy Spirit was and is the chief translator and interpreter. The Spirit works with the church to enable it to take Christ-like shape appropriate to its context. And the practice of discernment is first in two questions. What is the missionary spirit doing here? And what shape should the body of Christ take here? The first concerns the role of the spirit as the active leader of the church's mission. John V. Taylor's classic book, The Go Between God, opens with these words. The chief actor in the historic mission of the Christian church is the Holy Spirit. He is the director of the whole enterprise. The mission consists of the things that he is doing in the world. In a special way, it consists of the light that he is focusing upon Jesus Christ. Here, the Spirit is identified as the director of the mission, not from head office, but at head of the church on and beyond each front line of mission. And if this is the case, then obedient faith, setting out to follow wherever the Spirit leads, without knowing the outcome at the beginning, is normal for Christian mission. And I am convinced that the power of the Spirit is fundamentally powerful witness beyond our comfort zones and familiar practices. Acts, in Acts 1.8, you shall receive when power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. The move from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth conveys the essence of the missionary gift rather than being incidental to it. It is power to be led by the Spirit beyond the familiar to the next place that needs to engage with the gospel of Jesus. According to Luke Timothy Johnson, the narrative of Acts suggests that a company truly led by the Spirit will be led in new and surprising directions. 
A careful reading of Acts reveals a church continually surprised by the Spirit. Uh, I'll go off script again. I, I, I regularly suggest to people who I address about this that however long they've been Christians, they try and pretend they've never read Acts before. And they start at the beginning. At the end of every incident, they ask the question, did they expect that? Much of what we take now for granted was a surprise to the church at the time. Why should it be different for us? The church takes shape by following the missionary spirit. This involves more than spotting opportunities prepared for us. It faces us with the possibility of significant change. As the story of Peter and Cornelius illustrates, and I quote from Daniel Harvey and his son-in-law David Ford, God is already ahead of all evangelism, carrying on his mission to the world. More often than not, respectful discernment will demand drastic changes of heart and mind, as for Peter with his own traditions. And that's a reference to the story of Cornelius, at the beginning of which Peter prays that great Christian prayer which has been used through the centuries ever since, No, Lord. <laughs> Followed by, I have never. This is beyond my imagination. One pioneer minister who led his people out of their church building to plant into the local tower block described how they were all evangelized by the process. The further insight concerns the eschatological nature of the Spirit's work to which I've already referred. The Spirit is and brings the anticipation of the future Christ has already secured. The Spirit, according to Gordon Fee, is the certain evidence that the future has dawned and the absolute guarantee it's of its final consummation. In biblical language, the Spirit is first fruits, foretaste, down payment, guarantee of the final harvest. A new begin expounded his sign, instrument, and foretaste as follows. A sign planted in the midst of the present realities of the place but pointing beyond them to the future which God has promised, an instrument available for God's use in the doing of his will for that place, a foretaste manifesting and enjoying already in the midst of the messianic tribulations a genuine foretaste of the peace and joy of God's reign. Now this has two implications for praxis. First, the key to planting contextual church is not just a matter of establishing relevance, but of local prophetic foretaste of the future Christ has secured, demonstrated in that time and place. In other words, contextual churches are to be sources of hope, pointing to a future in which people can invest their lives. And as Alan Roxburgh emphasizes, the key to missional church lies in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Missional imagination is possible because of the presence of the Spirit, even when such imagination seems little in evidence. Uh, off script again, I sometimes do conferences for clergy and uh, talk about missional imagination. And if you are wearing a purple shirt, Anglican clergy don't tend to say to you, no, Bishop, you're wrong. But what I can see in their eyes is, it's all right for you, Bishop. My people haven't got any missional imagination. And that's the wrong question. The question is not, has this congregation got any missional imagination? The question is, is the Holy Spirit here? And we have a liturgy, we have a response in our liturgy when we celebrate communion in which the priest says the Lord is here and the congregation replies his spirit is with us. So I, I, I'm really rotten. I say let's be liturgical for about the Lord is here and they all say his spirit is with us. I say, well that settles it now. that we actually have to believe that if the Spirit of God is present, latent, latent missional imagination is present and appropriate leadership can release it so that it is recognized and owned. This was promised from the beginning. 
The dreams, visions and prophecies foretold by Joel and poured out at Pentecost are gifts, gifts to equip missional leaders to plant churches which are provisional foretastes of the future. That's what Pentecost is. It's the festival of first fruits. These gifts take forms far more diverse than some charic circles, some charismatic circles allow. And I speak as a charismatic of some 40 years falling. Uh, but they give substance to the promise of missional imagination. Good leadership cultivates an environment where that ima imagination can emerge. There is clear evidence that the vision for Fresh Expressions has released large numbers of new missional leaders in the Church of England and the Methodist Church. If empowerment for witness beyond one's comfort zone is the essence of the Pentecostal gift, then missional imagination is the key to discernment. And if one of the two hands of God is the Spirit, the other is the incarnation of, of the Son. As already stated, the pattern of God's unique, once for all, saving act provides the pattern for mission. Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 9 is based on the incarnation. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. I preached on that this morning. He engaged each culture from within to the full extent that rem was possible while remaining faithful to Christ. And in summary, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. To proclaim the cross faithfully, he imitated the incarnation. Andrew Walls writes, Mission involves moving out of oneself and one's accustomed to reign and taking the risk of entering another world. It means living on someone else's terms as the gospel itself is about living on someone else's terms. Again, I love that. The word becoming flesh, divinity being expressed in terms of humanity, and the transmission of the gospel requires a process analogous, however distantly, to that great act on which the Christian faith depends. And the more we pay attention to local context, the more an incarnational approach more necessary an incarnation approach becomes. Wars again, Christian faith is a bod embodied faith. Christ takes flesh among those who respond to him in faith. But there is no generalized humanity. Incarnation has always to be culturally specific. The fundamental meaning of the church is the body of Christ that it is Christ taking flesh in each context is often overlooked because of the other applications of the metaphor concerning the role and gifting of each member and the quality of relationships within it. But the essence is that Christ takes appropriate shape within each culture and context while remaining recognizably the Christ of the Gospels. This is made most explicit in the letter to the Ephesians. The church introduces his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ fills or completes each place by taking appropriate shape in the community of his followers. In this community, there is reconciliation with God and across cultural divides. A new humanity has been created. It's the people of the new heaven and new earth living in advance of that reality. Through it, God demonstrates his manifold wisdom to the forces shaping the present age. This new humanity is the body of Christ, clothed in transformed behavior and corporally putting on the armor of God, which is my summary of Ephesians 1 to 6. This makes mission a voyage of Christological discovery. As we see Christ take shape in contexts with which we are unfamiliar, the Lausanne consultation on contextualization said practicing contextualization is a way of discovering the fullness of the gospel through a living, growing encounter between the gospel proclaimed and lived, the Bible and the personal, social, political, economic, religious worlds in which we live. Further riches of Christ are revealed through mission. As Gouda says, they were not expanding the gospel 
as they followed the missional mandate of our Lord across all the safe boundaries of their world. The gospel was expanding then, and it still does. This has substantial applications for the local church, if it is to be in any sense mission law incarnational. To quote Newbigin yet again, unapologetically, this is the scariest Newbigin quote I know, the character of the local church will not be determined primarily by the character, tastes, dispositions, etc., of its members. Now, I've been a jobbing bishop spending eight years going round my parishes, and most parish communities, church communities I have met, are precisely determined by the character, tastes, and dispositions of its members. Rather, by, by those of the secular society by which and for which it lives, seen in the light of God's redemptive purpose revealed in Jesus Christ for all. No inclusive language that long time ago. So in other words, it is not the culture that shapes the church. It is what Christ has done that that culture might change that shapes the church. It is contextual as foretaste, not just contextual as relevance. This involves a deliberate, focused, incarnational approach, intending the local church to be not merely relevant, but a believable and hope-creating foretaste for the future Christ has secured for that context. A church where repentance is primarily turning from the inadequate and sinful to something better. Christology shapes ecclesiology in practice, not just in doctrinal theory. Once established, a fresh expression of church will be four-dimensional. Mission-shaped church calls these up, in, out, and of, and understands them as, as applications of the classic marks in the Nicene Creed. There will be a life towards God in prayer, worship, and holiness, a shared life with one another in fellowship, both, susta uh, uh, both sustaining an ongoing missional engagement in the neighborhood or network, that's the up, in, and out, and a clear sense of accountable connection to the wider church, that's the of. These combine to provide evidence that the Holy Spirit has been at work. The joint Anglican Methodist Faith and Order Report, fresh expressions in the, middle, in, the, in the mission of the church, applied the four marks in the same way. They wrote, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The creedal marks are signposts to guide the ecclesial journey of fresh expressions in the right direction. Rowan Williams defined church as an event around Christ. But the archbishop added one condition as so long as we have ways of identifying the same living Christ at the heart of every expression of Christian life in common. Each contextual church is a local expression of the body of the same Christ. How then can we be sure that the context does not distort the way Christ is locally expressed? First, we need to note that every context will distort to one degree or another. And that's why each local church has to be related to other local churches and to the universal church. Walls wrote, none of us can reach Christ's completeness on our own. We need each other's vision to correct, enlarge, and focus our own. Only together are we completing Christ. Isolated contextual churches create a distorted form of corporate Christian life. Solitary confinement is a form of cruelty, not a condition for local flourishing. So the birthing and recognition of fresh expressions of church inevitably and properly involves the navigation of a number of necessary and potentially creative tensions. In this last part, I'm saying, how do you know it's authentic church? And the answer is that you have to live within certain tensions from which God does not release us. These tensions are not necessary evils, 
are problems to be avoided if at all possible. They are the gift through which contextual churches gain recognition and remain authentic. And the first is the tension between stability and change. Stability and change belong together. I want to quote from uh, my British colleague Luke Bretherton, now teaching at Duke. This is a slightly long quote. What is common to Christianity is more like an immune system than a one-size-fits-all set of beliefs and practices. So what is the immune system that keeps us healthy and authentic? Like an immune system, Christian belief and practice grows over time and develops through both internal and external challenges. Without challenges, an immune system does not grow but remains weak and cannot adapt to new challenges. An immune system sometimes rejects and sometimes incorporates elements of those viruses and diseases it confronts. There's discernment. Like any system, it combines the ability to maintain an equilibrium and to rearrange itself to keep things steady with the ability of the system to grow, change, shape and adapt without breaking apart. A healthy system involves a balance between the two so as to enable maintenance and change. Neither, we will never change. You know the joke about how many Anglicans it takes to change a light bulb, what do you mean, change? <laughs> Neither a resistance of all change. A, uh, uh, a bishop I know inducted a new priest to a parish. The senior lay officers in Anglican parish are called church wardens. And this man had been a church warden for 25 years. It's not legal now, but it was then. And the bishop said, by goodness, you must have seen some changes in that time. Yes, he says, and I've resisted every single one of them. <laughs> so neither determined resistance to all change or to automatic engagement with change for change's sake uh, will actually help. Stability and change, unity and diversity. Fresh expressions are sometimes misunderstood as homogeneous units, but their purpose to reach for Christ, those who are not being reached by an existing congregation, is precisely to widen the local church's reach. The range of persons within a fresh expression may well be wider than that of a more traditional church congregation. An initial, sometimes very specific focus creates a bridgehead, not a final destination of the fresh expression's missional reach. And Leslie Newbegin, yes again, recognized that the existence of separate congregations in the same geographical area on the basis of language and culture may have to be accepted as a necessary but provisional measure for the sake of the fulfillment of Christ's mission but he also insisted that there must be effective interconnection between local congregations. Each local congregation must be knit by bonds of mutual recognition and mutual responsibility with the church in all places and ages. And he insisted, in my terms, that the, the inherited church must not require conformity to what it does as the condition of recognition. Recognition should not involve cultural imposition. These bonds must not be so interpreted that the lifestyle of another place or time is imposed on the local congregation as a condition of recognition. Personally, I can't think what he's talking about, but you might know. To be recognized is not to be identical. Discernment acknowledges diversity in unity which takes us to mission and unity. Mission and unity is a related creative tension, but it is mission's task to create the problem which the commitment to unity then has to address. The mission to the Gentiles created the primary issue of unity which the New Testament addressed. Mission created an initial disunity to establish greater unity in diversity. Unanswered questions about how unity will work are never a valid reason to refrain from innovative mission. The church lives in a dynamic creative tension as it responds to both callings and it may not let go of either. 
universality and particularity. Each local church, whether in inherited mode or a fresh expression, is a particular embodiment of a universal gospel which can only be embodied in particular contexts. Uh, our Faith and Order report said, from a fresh expressions perspective, all forms of church are provisional in nature and will continue to adapt in response to their changing context as new Christians enter the church. Contextual and prophetic. Perhaps the greatest weakness in contemporary church planting is that we find it much easier to plant something relevant than something prophetic. We've always known how to recreate the church of the past. We have postdoctoral qualifications in it. We're learning how to plant church which is relatively contemporary, though often too comfortable. What our world needs is prophetic church that offers, as previously stated, an imperfect foretaste of a believable future secured by Christ. However, an idealized, allegedly prophetic community which has no practical engagement with the struggles of ordinary local people is no more incarn incarnational than a traditional congregation stuck in the patterns of the past. I'm being a little vague and indefinite at this moment. Now, one thing remains to address. I'm aware that time is going. Recognition. One final discernment remains. The wider church needs to discern whether the fresh expression is an authentic expression of Christ's church. This may just be at the level of local cooperation, but it is likely to be a matter of formal recognition and authorization within a denomination. This can prove to be a challenge if the fresh expression is appropriately different in culture and ethos to more established forms of church. Rowan Williams recognized room for diversity of rhythm and style, so long as we have ways of identifying the same living Christ at the heart of every expression of Christian life in common. Now these will include the generic aspects of the life of a church mentioned earlier, particularly scripture and the dominical sacraments. But this process of discernment will take time. Despite the inevitable impatience of pioneers, evidence of a stable new Christian community does not appear overnight. So those who exercise the ministry of oversight, who have the power to recognize, authorize, or license, will need to develop a culture and practice of what I call provisional recognition. Fledgling fresh expressions, emerging missional congregations need support and encouragement while they are still developing the characteristics that will ultimately demonstrate that they are enduring expressions of church for their context. Regional or denominational leaders should not remain aloof until they see what has grown. They have a responsibility to do everything in their power to help the new initiative flourish. This process of support and discernment is vital for the health of the fresh expression and for the future health of the authorizing denomination or tradition. It is part of the health of a fresh expression that acknowledges its interdependence with the wider body of Christ and proper accountability within its tradition. This is not intended to be a dependent relationship the healthy relationship is one in which each partner in the mixed economy, inherited church and fresh expression, gives and receives. The importance of the relationship between denominational center and missional edge is recognized, is demonstrated in Acts 10 to 15. It's Peter and Cornelius again, and the resulting Jerusalem Council. In chapter 11, Peter returns to the center and is questioned about his missional activities on the edge. His report allows his hearers to make the same journey in understanding which he and his companions have already made. Their questioning was an essential part of the discernment process. When the wider issue of Gentile converts at Antioch is addressed at the Jerusalem Council, it is Peter's narrative again which helps the, er the elders discern what they should do without dividing the church. What we call connecting the center to the edge has been an important principle for the relating of fresh expressions to the Church of England. The center does not merely authorize the mission at the edge, in practice sometimes long after it has begun, 
but sees its own future at the edge and can learn, if it is willing, how to adapt its existing ministry to rapidly changing circumstances. So we've got there at last. To be authentic, the local church has to be contextual. To be contextual, it has to be seen to authentically embody the Christ of the scriptures and the creed. And I end with a prayer attributed to St. Brendan, the Celtic saint who got in his coracle. Help me journey beyond the familiar and into the unknown. Give me the faith to leave old ways and break fresh ground with you. Christ of the mysteries, I trust you to be stronger than each storm within me. I will trust in the darkness and know that my times even now are in your hand. Tune my spirit to the music of heaven and somehow make my obedience count for you. Amen. Thank you for listening.